Hello, and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. I welcome you on this August 31st, last day of August. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm going to leave it for someone else to say it. But, but I grew up in Saskatchewan, so, you know, winter basically starts tomorrow. I, <laughs> we're actually... I think it started two weeks ago. I, you know, like, I'm joking, uh, but it was like 13 degrees or something. Uh, you know what? In Berlin, it hasn't been that much better. It's been like high of 20. It's been pretty lame, frankly. Uh, Italy was fantastic, and it was nice to cool off afterwards. But anyway, welcome once again. I thought we'd do something kind of special this episode, and I thought we could just take a look at mining stocks. You know, it never hurts to look at the data, and I thought, let's take ourselves through the data, the financial data, and it's pretty interesting. I mean, lithium, lithium has basically done a 10x since last March. These stocks, the ETF. I remember we interviewed Rocktech Lithium at 55 cents. It's at like five something now. So, you know, like we always get caught up in so many narratives here, but wow. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to see what's going on. We just had the Fed meeting with Jerome Powell. And I mean, the takeaway from that was, you know, it was kind of classic Fed where we're doing something, but really nothing's going to change. And my takeaway from it was we are going to taper. I mean, they have continued the bond buying program, okay, since last March or April, whenever they started that. So they're going to start tapering, reducing the buying from the extraordinary measures and they're not thinking about raising rates and they're not even they didn't even put a date down on when they are going to start tapering they are basically i mean again my takeaway is they're they'd like to start tapering it doesn't even mean they're going to end the bond bind so extraordinary measures continue that was announced on friday i believe at the jackson hole meeting and the markets responded full on risk on and we got some green candles out of the stock market. And so there we are. So I guess the real boogeyman remains inflation because as we'll see in metal prices, our metals continue to be what I would call elevated. And the whole transitory narrative has really yet to play out. So I guess as long as they stay just elevated, nobody's freaking out. But if we go more than elevated, they're probably going to feel some more pressure to taper. So lots to look forward to this episode. We're going to take a real just look at what's going on in stocks and in our metals. And also uh, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, they just had their dinner and they have inducted five new members. And those people are Maybe even a couple of these people have been at the Global Mining Symposium. Don't quote me on that, but Patricia Dillon is definitely a familiar face. She has been welcomed. David Elliott has been welcomed. William Gladstone Jewett, Stephen D. Scott, and Mary Edith Tyrell. So congratulations to all of them. We may put Anthony Vaccaro's speech next week. We are going to look into that. If everything works out and the audio works out for the podcast, we shall do that. Until then, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts as well as SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to the news. Turning to the website, we have another takeover by a Chinese miner, Ganfeng Lithium. So again, lithium is hot. We have a couple of stories here. Bacanora Lithium accepts Ganfeng's $391 million takeover. And this is by Cecilia Jamazmi. And it says here, China's Ganfeng Lithium, one of the world's top producers of the battery metal, is going ahead with the takeover of Bacanora Lithium as the Mexico-focused explorer and developer has accepted a sweetened $391 million U.S. cash offer. Ganfeng increased its original bid, submitted in early May. So Bacanora also holds a 36% stake 
in Germany-focused Zinwald. So overall, the Chinese group's offer represents a 63% premium to Bacanora's closing share price on May 5th when they originally submitted a bid. And the bid, which would add the Sonora project in Mexico to Ganfang's global portfolio of lithium assets, comes as soaring lithium prices have triggered a wave of deals in the sector, including the recent mega merger of Australia's Galaxy Resources and Orocobre. Ganfang's improved offer has overcome a number of potential obstacles to a deal including meeting all preconditions outlined in the May announcement and securing Chinese authorities' approval. It still needs the support of shareholders owning more than 50% of Bacanora and the Mexican antitrust approval to seal the deal. Now, this is interesting. Following the original offer, a group of more than 400 investors orchestrated a campaign to block the deal, calling the offer derisory. Derisory, just looking that up here. Aren't that many words that I have to look up, I dare say, but derisory, I think I know what that means. Let's look at what derisory means. Ridiculously small or inadequate. So originally, in May, 400 investors orchestrated a campaign to block the deal, calling the offer derisory. But the revised bid has the backing of MNG Recovery Fund, which holds a 14% stake in Bacanora, Ganfang said. Prices for lithium in China have jumped more than 100% so far this year, according to Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, on the back of an expected demand increase from the electric vehicles sector. Ganfang, which already had a 50% stake in Bacanora's Mexican project, holds interests in mines in Australia, Argentina, and Canada, and around 70,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent of annual conversion capacity in China. The Sonora mine, expected to begin production in 2023, will produce 35,000 tons of lithium per year once in full production. So you can read more about it. There's actually some pretty interesting other stuff here about the Chinese strategy and how Ganfeng had picked up Canada's millennial lithium and how they picked up the Gugulamina lithium mine in Mali. So pretty interesting moves. You can see China, again, trying to secure their supply. So turning over to Australia, and once again, we have Australia trying to take over Canadian properties. And they have. Australia's Siona and Piedmont closed takeover of North American lithium. And this is by Mining.com staff. Siona Quebec, a joint venture of Siona Mining and Piedmont Lithium, has completed the acquisition of North American lithium. Siona Quebec is owned 75% by Siona and 25% by Piedmont. As part of the deal, Piedmont has agreed to take 50% of Siona Quebec lithium's carbonate output. So Siona is Australian. Let's see where Piedmont lithium is from, just out of curiosity. They seem to be US based. So interesting, an Australia-US takeover of North American lithium. So you see lithium is just white hot right now. And a little bit on the asset, North American lithium's chief asset was its suspended open pit mine about 60 kilometers north of Valdor, Quebec. The mine and mill at La Corne, Quebec, operated only briefly until the then owner sought creditor protection in 2019. It has annual capacity of 23,000 tons lithium carbonate. Sayona plans to restart the plant. Yeah, it just goes to show timing is everything. You know, I had a friend who was doing a lithium marketing newsletter here in Berlin for an ETF. Just randomly, a friend of mine was doing that. That job ended about a year, a year and a half ago because uh, the business was so bad. And you just just goes to show timing is everything because it's just totally taken off since then. Continuing on, Wailu fights for no rant with beefed up bid, sends shares higher. So you see a common thread here, battery metals. It's by Canadian Mining Journal staff. Wailu Metals is not ready to give up on its takeover bid for no rant resources. And don't forget Wailu Metals is an Australian company. And Norant Resources owns the high-grade Eagle's Nest Nickel Copper PGE project in Ontario's Ring of Fire. The Australian company is now offering 70 cents per share for the junior, besting BHP's friendly bid of 55 cents per share. The sweetened offer sent Norant shares up over 25%, or 16 cents to 76 cents, on August 30th. BHP came in with a $325 million offer, 
for Norant in July, after Wailu floated an initial $133 million offer for Norant in May. Wailu's offer also included a proposal to develop a future metals hub in Ontario. So let's see, so BHP's bid was for $0.55, cents and that was worth $325 million. So Wailu's offer must be close to, geez, I don't know, $450 million or something like that. Now, interesting detail. Notably, while Wailu is Naurant's biggest shareholder, the juniors board did not support its offer and adopted a poison pill provision to block it. Well, obviously, they way underbid if they originally bid $133 million, and then BHP comes and offers 325, which is still pennies, and now it's up to 450 or something close to that. In a press release, Wailu said it only made the initial offer because of Noron's intention to strike a deal with BHP that it says undervalued the Ring of Fire assets. And then get this, and we have a quote from Luca Chekovatsi, head of Wailu Metals, quote, In April this year, we were deeply concerned when the Noron board proposed to farm out Noron's exploration projects to BHP for only $25 million. Rather than consenting to such a transaction, we decided to make an offer to acquire the company. Our fears were justified when the Norant board completed a deeply discounted 5% placement to BHP, giving away a strategic toehold in the company to an obvious suitor. Now, I believe BHP is based out of Australia too, so we have two Australian companies battling over another battery metals-oriented property, I guess. We could call nickel battery metals, I think, at least EV. Giacovazzi added, since our initial proposal, we have listened to the feedback from shareholders who, like us, believe in the future of the Ring of Fire. We believe Noront shareholders deserve the chance to decide whether to join us in rebuilding the company and not to be pressured into selling all of their shares unless they want to. So, the plot thickens. A little more of the same. Another merger. It's by Maryland Scales. And Golden Predator in Arizona Gold merger creates Sabre Gold Mines, and the shareholders of both companies have overwhelmingly approved the merger of Golden Predator Mining and Arizona Gold. Arizona will acquire all the common shares of Golden Predator, as announced June 28, 2021, subject to regulatory approval. Arizona also intends to change the name of the company to Sabre Gold Mines, trading under the symbol SGLD on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And yeah, that's about it. So a merger there of Golden Predator and Arizona Gold to form Sabre Gold Mines, continuing on. You see, it's all M&A here. Isn't that interesting? Precipitate acquires Motherlode Gold property in Newfoundland, and this is by Northern Miner staff. Participate Gold has received approval from the Toronto Stock Exchange to acquire the 123.5 square kilometer Motherlode Gold project in Newfoundland's Burin Peninsula. Precipitate will issue... 395,000 common shares and pay $27,000 to the vendor. Additional shares and cash payments will be made over the next four years. At the end of the period, Precipitate will own 100% of Motherlode, subject to certain net smelter return royalties. So Precipitate thinks they might have something in Newfoundland, which is becoming increasingly an interesting mining district. And also Centera has filed a motion seeking a million dollars a day in penalties against the Kyrgyzstan government over the seizure of the Kumtur gold mine. And again, this was done in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York. And the motion states that the Kyrgyz government, quote, blatantly and continuously, end quote, violates the court's orders and has, quote, continued and intensified, end quote, its efforts to deprive Kumtur Gold Company and Kumtur Operating Company of the protections afforded to them under Chapter 11 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code, much in the same way that it illegally took over the mine. So, Sentara continues to fight over what happened there in Kyrgyzstan. And again, this is a, one of our big themes. Uh, you check out the George McLeod episode. Check out last episode. Uh, we had a great story by Cecilia Jamazmi on an increase in resource nationalism globally and the data to back it up. And finally... High metal prices push exploration budgets up in 2022, according to S&P Global. And this is by Henry Lazenby. S&P Global Market Intelligence Pipeline Activity Index points to mineral exploration budgets increasing by 5 to 10% in 2022, according to metals and mining analyst William Mason, who said this at a recent conference. 
The increase is not as significant as in previous years as a projected moderate softening of most metal prices from current levels way on the outlook. And we have a quote from William Mason. From 2023 to 2025, we expect budgets to pull back slightly as the COVID-19 pandemic economic recovery subsides and global economic growth returns to a more moderate pace. According to Mason, exploration budgets generally move with metal prices, often with a one-year lag. Quote, the improving commodity prices were insufficient or too late, however, and the pandemic-induced price falls of the March quarter of 2020 have been followed by solid metal price rebounds with gold and copper hitting record highs. Since then, quote, the improving commodity prices were insufficient or too late, however, to offset other pandemic-related challenges to the exploration sector, resulting in lower budgets for 2020. The exploration price index rose 31% year over year in 2020, leading S&P to project an estimated 25 to 35% increase in exploration budget in 2021. Okay, so basically higher metal prices are expected to push exploration budgets up in 2022, according to William Mason. So that's what's going on in the mining scene, at least according to the Northern Miner podcast. And with that... Let's take a look at metal prices. And turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week, and I do like to preface it with the 10-year bond, thanks to CNBC, which is at 1.287%, and that is 0.004% higher than last week, so hardly a change, despite the Jackson Hole Conference that the Fed famously has at the end of August each year. Turning to our metals, gold is trading at $1,814.95 per ounce. That is $10 higher than last week. Silver is also trading higher at $24.17 per ounce. That is $0.44 cents higher than last week. Platinum is trading at $1,013.44 per ounce. That is $7 lower than last week. Palladium is trading at $2,494.78 per ounce. That is $24 higher than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.24 per pound. That is $0.19 cents higher than last week. Aluminum is trading at $1.21 per pound. That is $0.04 cents higher than last week. Lead is unchanged at $1.12 per pound. Nickel is at $8.58 per pound. That is 16 cents higher than last week. And tin is at $15.63 per pound. That is 35 cents higher than last week. Cobalt is trading at $22.73 per pound. That is 49 cents lower than last week. And zinc is trading at $1.35 per pound. That is a penny higher than last week. So I would say wind in the sales of commodities, apart from a couple here and there, but generally everything rising up, we might call it risk on, as the Fed has really been quite dovish, as they say, and so commodity prices got a lift. And you can see the the Fed is betting that this will subside and that basically maybe they go up a little higher, but ultimately commodity prices will come back down. So interesting times. Will they be right? We shall see. I guess you'll just have to tune in next week to find out. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we are going to take a tour through mining stock prices. We're going to look at gold and silver stocks. We're also going to look at lithium and uranium stocks and copper stocks. And we are just going to get a sense of what's going on as we head out of the main summer months into the fall and see where we stand. So we 
are going to start with gold, and we are going to look at one of the bellwethers, Barrick Gold, and it is trading currently at $19.81. This is on the U.S. on the New York Stock Exchange. This is the American price. So $19.81. Its previous high was $30.87. And that was in August of 2020, so a year ago. And it's been nothing but basically a slow moving downward slope with a little bump in May of this year and then continuing lower. So 30% down from its you know high of the last five years, which was in last almost like almost to the day, like August 30th, it looks like of 2020. So very interesting. There's a PE of 14. And generally they say 15 is kind of like a normal PE. In this market though, with stocks like Amazon and Facebook, you're going to get much higher, but traditionally a PE of 15 is thought to be fair value. And so this is at 14, which in an expensive market may be seen as a bit of a value play. And they have a dividend of 1.82%. So nothing special. But basically, it is at, its its 52-week low is $18.64, okay? And it's at $19.81. So it is at its 52-week lows, pretty much. So that is Barrick. Let's take a look at their competitor, Newmont. And they are currently trading on the New York Stock Exchange at $57.51. Now, interesting for them... Their previous 52-week high, their, their chart looks a lot nicer. And their previous 52-week high was in May when they were trading at $73.48. So that might just be Barrick and not the gold stocks in total that are not doing so great. You know, and if we go back to August when Barrick was having a great time, if we go back to around August 30th of last year, Newmont was at $65. So a different trajectory, and the chart looks a lot healthier too with Newmont. You see like an uptrend from 2019 that is largely, is pretty much unbroken. So again, about 20% from the all-time highs that were only May 23rd, only a few months ago. So much different story with Newmont. Now, the PE is 16, so a little higher than Barrick's. But the yield, the dividend yield on Newmont is 3.78%. So that is basically double Barrick's dividend. And 3.78% is a very healthy yield. One wonders if this is the reason why the stock has held up so much better. Because if we look at GDX, the Van Eck Vectors Gold Miners ETF, so a group of gold miners, that chart looks much more similar to Barrick's chart, right? And most gold stocks don't offer a dividend, uh, or at least nothing to write home about. So if we look at GDX, we see, you know, last August, a high of $43.60. Today, it is trading at $32.28. So we're talking about, uh, you know, 25 to 30% move down from the previous highs. And so there is a yield on GDX of 0.56%. There is no PE. So, but you see what I'm saying? You might see the influence then of the dividend at work here. There may be other factors at work too. I mean, Barrick's had a challenging 10 years. Now let's look at Agnico Eagle and compare what we see. And we're going to go to the Toronto Exchange for that, the Toronto Stock Exchange. So now they peaked last November of November 2020. So these stocks are taking much different trajectories. They are peaking out at different times. How bizarre is that? But they're all kind of a little beaten up now. So that is interesting. So Agnico Eagle 
Its 52-week high was $117.35. Again, on the Canadian markets, it is currently trading at $72.86. Now, I remember it trading at $72 back in 2010. Let me just get the 10-year chart here. I remember convincing my mom to buy Agnico Eagle at $72 in like 2009, 2010, and it's basically done nothing in 10 years. I mean, it's gone down and it's gone up and it's come back down. But overall, the chart is up and a much healthier chart than Barrick's. Uh, it seems to, like kind of like Newmont, have a pretty straight line up. It looks much better than GDX now. What do we see here? We see a dividend yield of 2.39%. So healthy dividend yield, PE of 18.76. So... There is Agnico. So again, this dividend thesis seems to be holding. Finally, let's look at a couple more. Let's look at Kirkland Lake, which has been a big mover in the last couple of years. And then we'll go to a streamer like Franco, Nevada. And then we're just going to have a good idea of what has happened. Now, Kirkland Lake, that is a completely different chart. For the most part, I'm looking at the 10-year chart, of course. Let me just back up here. If we look at the five-year chart, peaked out August of 2020, similar to Barrick and Newmont, peaked out at $72.52, has been more or less trailing lower since, but not breaking its uptrend. Uh, it is currently at $49.36, so about, you know, 30% lower than its previous high in last August of 2020. So a healthy looking chart, although again, down significantly. A dividend yield of 1.89%, PE of only 12.7. So I could see this looking attractive from a value perspective. Now, the chart has gone from like $6 in 2017 to, you know, up to 72 So, you know, take that for what it is to do your own research. And I should mention, I do not own any of these stocks. I am basically 98% in crypto and I have a couple of healthcare stocks that are just juniors that I like. So... Full disclaimer, I am not trying to convince you to buy or sell anything, just observing what's going on as someone who has watched these markets for near a decade now. And finally, let's look at Franco Nevada, another favorite. So that chart looks to be one of the healthiest. Interestingly, they peaked out, you know, just in the last month. Isn't that interesting? They peaked out at $163 and 79 cents and they are currently trading at a hundred forty three dollars and 88 cents so a little pullback but that's just like maybe a you know 10 percent pullback 10 15 percent pullback nothing compared to the others and it looks like a much steadier chart i mean they did drop in february of 2021 all the way to 109 dollars from you know almost the levels they're at now so it's been a bit of a V move, but overall, it looks like a much healthier. Uh, there's been a bit more volatility, you might say, but overall has held up much better than all of the other gold stocks. So an interesting, you know, they say the streamers should be more secure. Now, they traded a premium. The PE, the price to earnings ratio is almost 41, okay? And the dividend yield is you know, fairly low at 0.83%. So you see the premium that's attached to the streamers because they don't carry the same risk in the in the field, so to speak, of a mine flooding. Like they do have a little bit of that, but overall they have a bit more of a diversified and secure portfolio. So those are gold stocks. Now let's take a look at silver stocks. Turning to silver stocks, let's start with First Majestic, another bellwether. And, you know, silver is kind of known for being kind of a smaller, there's not as many companies to choose from. So let's take a look and go on the two-year chart here. We see that it peaked out on January 31st of 2021, it had a big move from $18 all the way up to $30, peaked out there, and now it's back at 1620 
bit of a parabolic move. Uh, it generally trends around 20 bucks, and so fairly low compared to where it's been, at least, you know, since for a year and a half. I mean, at the bottom of COVID, it was at 694 in March of 2020, but uh, now it's at $16.20, and silver stocks got quite expensive there for a while, so they have pulled back quite a bit. That'd be about 50%, 45% from the previous high in January of this year. So see how differently these stocks act. It's a little surprising to me. Let's look at Pan American, another bellwether. And we'll go on the American exchange here. It's trading at $25.78. A bit more of a consistent chart. It peaked out in January at $39.62. So, you know, maybe a 40% drop from the highs, but a much steadier chart. And it's just been trailing down since about May. Almost all of the stocks we've looked at, for the most part, have been trailing down since May. So, very interesting there. It has a PE of 18 and a dividend yield of 1.56%. So, that is Pan American. And just going back to First Majestic for a second, what was the PE on First Majestic? Oh, well, isn't this interesting? So the PE on First Majestic was 36, and the yield is only 0.2%. So, hmm, interesting. Let's take a look at Hecla. Hecla Mining, another classic. So Hecla is trading at $6.06, again, on the U.S. markets on the New York Stock Exchange. Previous high of $9.44, and that was back in June of 2021. So another different time that it peaked out compared to the others. Has been trending downwards. So again, we're looking at about a 35% drop from the previous high in June. And... Looks like a decent enough chart. The PE is 96. So sometimes these PEs can be strange. Like they might have a big project that's about to start. So that might be priced in. So you can't necessarily, you don't, you can't always make too much of the PE. Dividend yield of 0.75%. Nothing to write home about, but something. Now let's take a look at Fortuna, one of my favorites to look at. Wow, they have come back down. So very interesting. Fortuna Silver at its previous high was at $9.85. And that looks like it was about, that looks like it was in January. So Fortuna has come back down from its high of $9.85 in January and is down at $4.32. Very interesting. Uh, usually when silver performs, Fortuna performs. A PE of only 11, no dividend yield. This used to be one of James Dine's favorite uh, stocks, and so I always remember it. So those are your silver stocks. Now let's take a look at some copper companies. Let's look at FCX, and this is a much more positive chart than we've seen from our precious metal charts. So interestingly, peaked out in May of this year at $46.10, currently trading at $35.61, very healthy chart. May have broken a kind of uptrend in June, and now it's kind of trailing sideways, almost trying to figure out is there, in, it's almost like the trade kind of got canceled a little bit. So now it seems kind of range bound sideways. It is at $35.62. The PE is 18, which is, you know, considering how hot copper is, is as a commodity, the PE of 18 is not, you know, a super high PE. The dividend yield is 0.82%, so nothing to write home about. So, yes, yeah, so that's Freeport, you know. How far from the previous highs in May? Maybe 20% down. Moving on, let's check out the Southern Copper Corporation. They are a big miner. And so they are at $62.06. Their previous high 
was $83.29. That was also in May. So following a similar trajectory. Now, they have a dividend yield of 5.71% and a PE of 17. So that's a pretty healthy dividend yield, isn't it? 5.71%. So they are giving their money back to shareholders. And they are at $62, peaked out at $83.29. And so that is Southern Copper. And let's check out First Quantum. And this is on the Toronto Exchange. And they are trading at $26.41, peaked out also in May at $35.07. So they are down, you know, maybe 30% from the all-time high. Uh, Again, kind of range-bound, similar to Freeport. And they are trading at a PE of 45. Again, you can't make too much. They may have a project in the pipeline that, They are not making money on, but that's getting priced in. But nevertheless, PE of 45 and a dividend yield of 0.04%, so next to nothing. Ivanhoe Mines made a move from, it basically has just been a straight line with some kind of little pullbacks along the way. But Ivanhoe Mines has gone from $2.40 to $10 and is basically close to an all-time high. So Ivanhoe is bucking the trend. If you look at tech resources, they kind of have a mix of stuff. Uh, They are doing fairly well as well. They're at $20, 52-week high of $26.99 back in May. So they are trading at a PE of 92. So again, not everything is revealed by the PE, but nevertheless, a dividend yield of only 0.7%. Let's look at Solgold, a company with much controversy, hasn't really done much. I think some of the news flow has hurt Solgold, just speculating there. He's at 49.5 cents, so 50 cents, uh, 52 week high of 72 cents back last October. Yeah, no PE. So interesting. Now let's take a look at uranium stocks. There are all sorts of fun companies in uranium. So let's start with. Cameco, and this is on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and it is trading at $22.77 per share. No PE, because I believe they are losing money right now. Market cap of $9 billion, dividend yield of 0.36%. They peaked out in June. They have had a nice run from November 2020 at $12 all the way to June, where they went to 26, and now they are trading at 22.46. So they've come down a bit, maybe only 15%, uh, 15, 20%. And so that is Cameco, another bellwether in the uranium sector. If we check out Uranium Energy Corporation, they are at $2.42. Their previous high was just this last, was in April at $3.67. They're at 242. So they have pulled back. Uranium stocks had a nice run. And like most other mining stocks, there's been like a big pullback of, you know, 20 to 30% basically. No PE, no dividend, uh, you know, smaller market cap. Again, Cameco was at $9 billion. These guys are at half a billion, 563 million to be precise. Uh, next gen, in a sense, with uranium, you're dealing with a lot more juniors. Uh, FYI. Uh, now, next gen really hasn't missed a beat. It is almost at its all time highs from June. Its previous high was $6.08 and it's at $5.80. So, next gen energy continues to attract capital. And let's not forget, Cameco has some of the best assets in the world and is valued at $9 billion. The market cap of NextGen is $2.76 billion, and they have, as far as I understand, no production. So, you know, again, I don't own any of these things. To me, that's a bit of a warning. Uh, There's a lot of speculation. Maybe the property is that good, though. So, you know, I'm just looking at the charts here and just comparing. I'm not an analyst. 
Find a couple of more uranium. Then we can go to, you know, some little lithium, that sort of thing. Let's look at denizen mines. Now, denizen mines, you know, the, like, let's not forget, October, November 2020, they're trading at 45 cents. They went all the way up to a buck 80 this June, and it has pulled back, and it's starting to come back up a bit. It's at $1.54, not too far below, you know, maybe 20% below previous highs in June. So not really too bad, you know, if you're invested in denizen mines. Let's look at fission. Uh, so fission uranium in November was at 26 cents, went all the way up to 70 cents, and now is trading at 57 cents. So starting to climb out of its hole that it was in for a very long time. Again, no PE, no yield. These are juniors. UEX is at 37 and a half cents, previous high of 50 cents back in June. Blue Sky Uranium, previous high 29 cents. Now it's at 17. If we look at the Uranium ETF, that'll give us kind of a clearer picture of what's going on. So started to make its move last October, November at $11, basically doubled, went up to $23.47. And now is trading at $20.58, so very respectable. So uranium still has some momentum. Finally, let's just look at Global Atomic. And wow, look at this. So last November, $0.58. Cents, steady climb all the way to $3.25. So that is basically a, you know, what is that, a 5X? So one of the big performers, I'd say, is Global Atomic. Peaked out at 334 and now it's just at $3.05, so it looks healthy. Very healthy, so down 10% after a massive run. Those are your uranium stocks. And finally, let's look at lithium. I am not an expert in lithium stocks. Probably not an expert in any of these stocks, but I am much more familiar with, say, the uranium, gold, and silver and even the rare earth. Lithium Americas, for example, you know, it's hard to measure. Like these things have kind of gone in a straight line since COVID in March 2020. So it was at 221, $2.21. And today is at $19.73. So 10x since March 2020. Hit a peak in January at $28.75. So that would have been quite a move. And it was parabolic. It went from December to January. It went from $9 to $23, $28.75 intraday. And now it looks like it's about to climb again. Maybe that's why we're seeing all this M&A activity, at least Lithium Americas. Look, let's look at the Lithium ETF. Global X Lithium and Battery Tech ETF. And that, again, is just a straight you know, 40 degree line up. And that from March 2020, when it was at $18, it is now at $85.08. Basically, right near its, you know, 52 week highs. The 52 week high is $87.20. That looks like it happened a few weeks ago in August, you know. So, lithium looks like it has been the trade of the last two years in the mining sector. And it's funny, you don't actually, I haven't really heard that much about lithium being the trade. You hear how there's a lot of excitement around EVs, but wasn't quite aware of this. Let's take a look at Rock Tech Lithium. And wow, okay, so they were at 37 cents in March 2020, and now they are at $5.15. They peaked out. They had this incredible parabola from December to January, along with, you know, Lithium America's also had a big jump there from $1.15, let's say, up to $6.51. And it says here the 52-week high is $9. So they may have had an intraday high where it basically went up like <laughs> 8x in like a few weeks, like two or three weeks. Um current market cap, $290 million. Really nice guys. One of them's in Berlin here. Uh, we interviewed him uh, maybe a couple of years ago when the stock was at 55 cents. And so that is a little taste 
of what's going on. Again, I'm not a big lithium stock guy, so I'm trying to think. Now, if we look at that, say, American producer, Piedmont, they also, they're at $57.82. They're down from $81. They've also had a very nice move from, you know, like March 2020, they're at $4.75. Okay, they're at $57.82, peaking out at... $88.97. So if you bought this lithium stock, you would have easily 10x'd more than that. So now here it says Piedmont Lithium is also listed in Australia. I'm not exactly sure. I I went to their website. It looked like American. I'm I'm not sure where Piedmont Lithium is from. Uh, But interesting chart, that's for sure. So again, you just see this parabolic move first in Australia. October, September, you know, a parabolic move from December to January in a matter of like, you know, six weeks from December to late January, early February 2021. Let's find one more lithium stock. And you see, you see the value of the Northern Miner as I do these searches, because it's actually hard to find some of these stocks sometimes, especially something like lithium. So all you have to do is go to the Northern Miner, put in lithium. It's like, oh, Bacchanora. Oh, American Lithium. Oh, Pilbara Minerals. You know, so that's one of the great things about the Northern Miner. So let's check out Bacchanora Lithium on the London Exchange, London Stock Exchange, and let's put in the five-year chart here. So at COVID was at 19 pounds and 25 pence. It's up at 66, so a little over a triple. Uh, So a lot of speculation in the lithium stocks. Check out SQM. So SQM is trading at $51.97. In March 2020, it was at $15. And basically, you know, again, December, January, and, you know, last fall to January went basically from, you know, $30 to $53. So it hasn't been a stellar performer. It, it, the chart isn't quite as pretty as some of these other lithium stocks. Let's take a look at Ganfang. Let's look at the Chinese lithium producer, which is in the news. Put in the five-year chart. So it's also had a big run in September 2020. It was at 47 yuan. Now it's at 220. If we go to Changchi Lithium, I believe another Chinese company. If we go to the five-year chart, we see, yeah, huge parabolic move. Uh, first from November to January, it went from 23 to 23 to 60, and then it went back down to 36, and now it's at 136. So lithium stocks are very hot and have made some huge moves. So let's leave it there. I hope this has been interesting, just to give us a sense of where everything kind of stands in relation to each other. I'm sure there are some picks. There are many companies, obviously, that I left out of here, but I just wanted to do a little survey and just see what's going on out there from a price perspective. And my conclusion really is gold and silver look attractive from a value perspective, don't they? They have pulled back, you know, on average, let's say 30%. Copper is, you know, really depends on the company. It looks like it's kind of you know, beholden to whatever happens to the copper price. And that's why it seems like it's range bound with the copper price in the last few months. And it's kind of like this inflation debate. Will it be transitory or not? I mean, that's what's going on with copper that I see. Uranium, again, it's an oversupplied market. So as Tim Gitzel says, but the fundamentals look good in the future. And so that's what you're seeing in the stock. So he, a lot of speculation there. I was even sent an article on how the Kazakhstan main company over there is buying uranium off the spot market as well. So that was really interesting. So uranium seems to be continuing on its journey of speculation, but what I'd call like legitimate, you know, it's not just hype there. And lithium is kind of a real head turner and a really hot market. So, you know, as they say, you don't necessarily want to ape into stuff when it's already done a 10x, but you never know where that thing could go. So it's got the fundamentals 
end the hype, but a bit more, you know, I proceed with caution, frankly, on all of these. But that is a taste of what we see out here. Again, I hope you enjoyed it. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory and send it to your friends. And if you know any students, by all means, send it to them, especially if they're starting their geology degree. Until next week, take care.